The Amiga computer was so versatile that it could emulate a vast number of other machines, 8 and 16 bit, even arcade machines of that time. So we're going to begin by looking at Wazonka Lad, which is a Game Boy emulator. You can see there is a simple palette editor there, so we can change the Game Boy palette externally to any D-Paint palette. There is also a warped version for people using an all 20 CPU, a fast version if you've got an all 30, and if you've got an all 40 like I have at the moment on this emulator, we can run the full, and if you're having all 60, it will run too quickly. So this is Wazonka Lad, it was the last release version, it's the full release version, whatever it was, and it will take some options to set up before we can actually play anything on the emulator. And so we won't get any information from any cartridges because we haven't inserted any at the moment. You can see Wazonka Lad is, well, the full freeware version, and this runs on Workbench. So you can see a number of options, graphics options and sound effects and things like that. And there's even pull down menus where we can load up the games that we've already played already. And also a favourites menu as well where we can simply, well, we can have that programmed and edited to whatever we like. But that will quick load whatever we've got in the favourites. So the ROMs, as far as I know, are already built into this software, so we don't have to worry too much about those. But if we go into the preferences, it will say the ROM, I think that's actually the game ROM that we're supposed to find. And you can also click on get. So if we assign all those directories to the relevant ones on the install, once we've installed that, then we can set up the save directories for pictures and also save states and things like that. You can see all of the directories are listed there, so it's not very difficult to find the right one. And the ROM at the top, that's simply pointing to a Game Boy directory I've got full of games. And you can see XPK pack, so when you're saving a game, saving a save state, whatever, it will crunch it down and use whatever it likes to crunch that down, I'm selecting none for that and you can select various options for your save states, I'm not too worried about that and also the controller options, I'm going to leave it on keyboard because it doesn't seem to recognise either of the joysticks that I've got plugged in at the moment so I'm going to leave that on keyboard and battery on off, just leave those on the standard and if you want to save all those preferences you have to save them as default or you can save them per ROM if you want to do, but if you save default, that will mean that those are automatically loaded every time that you load this software. So hopefully, at some point, we're going to click on default, and you can also close those preferences if you've also saved them up. And you can see the graphics options. We're running full at the moment. If you have a slow computer, you can try the X153. And that takes a number of shortcuts to put things on the screen. But we're going to leave it on full for now. And you can see various screen modes, AGA. And also its own screen mode as well. We can have that all on its own screen mode. Or we can have that on the workbench window. And I've set up the workbench window so that it's scalable. And you can see that set up 320 times 290, which is for me that looks quite good on workbench. You can have that scaled to any scale size that you like, simply by dragging that window around and then saving up those preferences. It will actually save the window that you set up on that screen, so the window floats on top of everything. And you can see variables. We can also frame skip if we want to do that. We don't really want to do that at this point and variables x y i think that moves things around the screen and you can see auto load we can set up our own screen palette as well that we've already seen so let's move on to the sound effects we want audio on and we've hiked that up to 10 and the audio is in higher quality and all of these options don't seem to work unfortunately on my setup and paul fast 8 bit seems to work that's the one that comes out of the box pre-set up and that does work, but I can't see Paula Fast 8 bit, I can only see the ordinary ones, and all these silly cards aren't working anyway. So the one that worked for me is the Win UAE option, which is the only option, and that's why I had to increase the volume 
on this thing up to 10 and then I can actually hear it so that's what I actually did to get that working it's running on all four channels so hopefully now we've set up everything we can put the pictures into fast RAM and we can also type in game genie patches from here as well if you have game genie to hack those things whatever you can type those in and um, multitasking that's got something to do with the workbench I'm just gonna leave that alone for the moment so hopefully now all those things are set up we can now ignore the middle column because that's for save states so the first column is to choose our game and I've installed a few games not every single game we're gonna move through every single one of these on this video and we'll check those out so this is spider-man licensed to well licensed software whatever so we can now run that and that will automatically run that let's just position this on the screen and now it runs and also hopefully has some music as well you can see using the r40 it runs at full speed and hopefully full speed music as well and hopefully without any frame skipping this is as close as you're gonna get to a Game Boy on an Amiga first of all we're gonna check out the screen option this window mode and you can see in window mode it shows us a nice green option with kind of faded green and dark green as well so that gives us more or less what we got on a Game Boy and I'm not sure if it was the actual green screen on a Game Boy or whether they just put a green filter all over the top of it but whatever you can see we're now playing Spider-Man you can see we can hop around and jump and we can also collect things and we can also spin our webs so the Amiga could emulate a vast number of things it can even emulate well if you really wanted to it can emulate a Nintendo 64 and a 3DS and all these different things it might only run at one frame per second but it could actually do that if you really wanted to do that and that's simply preloading things and hacking the hardware together in software and it runs that software like it's hardware so you can design any emulator you like to emulate any computer you like even recent MS-DOS machines and Windows and things like that even the recent Apple Macintosh but you'd have to emulate those and unless you have maybe a 2000 megahertz CPU it's going to be struggling to cope with that but the Game Boy unfortunately is carryover from the 8-bit days on the 8-bit machines and it's basically a Commodore 64 or something like that remember the original NES computer was a basic homage or a hack of the Commodore 64 they even hacked the CPU so that was their answer to the Commodore and maybe this was again some kind of 8-bit competitor in the handheld market that Nintendo held completely and utterly in those days and you can see I'm not having any luck whatsoever against Mysterio this is the very first level of the game and this is the very first time I've tried any of these games or I'm going to try any of those games in this particular video because I never had a Game Boy back in the day but I have played Tetris and I borrowed Tetris well I had you know I played it while somebody else had it and it's like oh, alright you know Tetris fine I had it on my Commodore 64 with great music so just like the PS1 version we can climb up walls as well in this version and unfortunately that's game over so that means that we have now played that game we can now press escape and I'm playing this I'm actually remapped controls using anti-micro onto a d-pad I'm using a PS2 d-pad and I've remapped the keyboard controls on my PC and every time I press a button on the keypad it simply inputs that as a keyboard control and so that saves me actually having to press the keyboard so I have done that it is possible to do that if you get anti-micro I've put a video on how to use anti-micro on one of my channels if you type it in you'll find it hopefully so that's how I configured my controller in this case and hopefully if you have a controller that's compatible it will actually pick that up within the software so now again first time I've ever seen this it's Batman and Batman you can see it's well like a small benefactor kind of game where we get to 
go around shooting things and supposed to time things so we don't get hit but timing things is boring so I'm not going to do that and also we can shoot things with our endless gun it looks like um, Batarang and we can pick up look at that extra life so we can jump about four times our own height so this is grasshopper batman so let's see if we can jump up well if we remove those blocks we can get that that gives us some more health but unfortunately due to the lame aspects we cannot duck and fire kill those guys at the same time it looks like so this is my first experience batman and you can see we now have a shield, a bat shield. And that means hopefully we can take a few hits in this game without taking any further damage. And that doesn't appear to be working because I'm simply wandering into those enemies anyway. So I'm not sure whether that means that we're invulnerable at this point. You might notice a few slowdowns in some games when the action gets packed even with all 40 but trust me if you try this with an all 60 or higher it will simply run too quickly and the answer to that is you can increase the screen size that we're using at the moment and that will slow it down so if it runs twice as quick it means you can have twice as quick well twice as big screen size and that means it will run at normal speed so let's try Batman versus the Joker. Anybody who's played Batman on the Amiga knows how easy it is to control the bat rope. You press a button and you're already swinging, but on this game it's pretty difficult and the double jump is also a nightmare to get used to so I'm having a hard time actually getting used to the controls before I can even play that game so I'm one of those platform fans who think well definitely there must be something up there in that corner we definitely need it so somehow it should be possible to get up there and that's why I'm wasting my time at the moment trying to double jump my way with this stupid inertia and it looks like I've given up on that fact on the Amiga version you couldn't use your bat rope to kill people at a distance and I really should have been using that on my play guide my low scoring run but I didn't unfortunately unfortunately on this version you can't appear to do that and we're getting infinite hearts so it looks like we can beat health out of our opponents and look at that we've just managed to well sink ourselves in that level and now it looks like we're going to soon be dead by pressing escape we can escape out of that and with this emulator well with anti-micro it saves up your last commands in a buffer so sometimes when i press escape it means that the cursor moves left to right if I happen to be moving left to right at that time. So Battle Unit Zenith I think that said. And that's another game. Let's check it out. It's got loads of introduction screens. And maybe this came out only in Japan. quite a few of these robot shooters that appeared in Japan mostly on the NEC machines but definitely on the Game Boy you get them as well and they were inspired by the huge mech machines in the movies and things like that and those mech machines went on to inspire other games and other genres and even ended up appearing in Godzilla and things like that so these mech fighters it reminds me a tiny bit of maybe Thexter and this is just a normal shooter where you have to press the button over and over again to keep your jetpack going and if you don't you'll fall to the floor and you can't do that because there are power-ups to collect and you collect those power-ups it gives you an advantage that you really need in this game 
enough of that, let's move on to another one. And, oh no, we're not going to look at Billy Elliot's NASCAR racing, are we? Oh no, this is basically Days of Thunder or something like that that was famously ported across to the world's slow state bit handheld so I can't imagine this is going to set the world on fire with speed records let's see, let's penetrate the game and we get some stats all of which mean nothing to me at the moment and we can tune up our car and just like at Rune on the Amiga, it begins with an immaculate screen that makes you think this is going to be amazing, and then that screen disappears and it reveals the actual game itself. So this game is very slow and it runs slower than the Amstrad version, the Amstrad CPC version, and it's definitely, well, it's actually quicker than the Amiga version in some respects. If you get onto the straights and there's no cars in the way, it's actually an acceptable frame rate. But apart from that, you can see the screen having to redraw itself ridiculously. And look at that, we're now playing Indy 500 on the Amiga. So get rid of the next corner, and it's coming up. Those arrows are going to be pointing, there you go. And now it judges to a grinding halt. So if you're really desperate to play a 3D racing game on the Game Boy, then for heaven's sake, do not ever be tempted to play that ever again. So let's move on. This is Cliffhanger. This is Sylvester Stallone. So now we're getting into the licensed products, Sony ImageSoft. So Sony software, hopefully now, we can get in something that's a little bit more playable. So Cliffhanger, come do some music. which might be slightly messed up on this version and it also comes with the storyline as well a jet crashes and it's your job to go out and get that money and for this game I'll be trying two different screen modes so let's stick with the normal one for now and you can see the game moves at the right speed and it's playing the music alright and so that means you can play cliffhanger and this, I actually have played this before for the From Bedrooms to Billions documentary that never actually came out and that was chronicling every single platform, well every single game and every platform so you can see now that we're playing this we can change it to screen modes if we would like to do that, a public screen and none of these public screens actually work because if you set them to anything other than the lowest resolution it will be a postage stamp in the middle of your screen so I'm going to set this, well don't even set it to 320 well that's the lowest that I can get actually if I move it anywhere near the higher ones on this emulator I'm not going to get anything so that's what I'm going to have to use 320 times 128 and so if I close that and run the software it should put us back hopefully where we were and it's put an hourglass on the screen that's because that freezes our mouse pointer wherever it was and it's also cuts off the last four pixels on the bottom of that screen but apart from that you can see it's now running a tad quicker in full screen mode and it's changed the colours into a brown landscape which I don't think you can change in full screen mode but I'm not too worried about that so unfortunately for you guys I'm now going to be playing this for the rest of this video in full screen mode with this brown colour so if that's a problem then you can switch it off now but if it isn't then that's how I'm going to be experiencing it it's more or less full screen mode and if you had a proper TV with CRT then you could use the controls to change the screen and make it a tiny bit smaller and use overscan so it fits on there what I'm actually trying to do at the moment is trying to run because I've played this game before, I know when you collect the boots and you tap twice in the direction it makes the character run. Fine, but why is it not doing that on the Amiga? I'm tapping twice in the direction, it's not doing anything. I'm holding down the buttons, it's not doing anything. It's not making the character run, and if I run without running like that, unfortunately I'm going to die. And I've played this game before, I know that you're supposed to run there. And unfortunately it's not working. So that means we're going to have to quit out of that and we're also going to have to pause the emulator by pressing the P key as well to get control of our mouse back otherwise that will appear to be locked out 
So remember, when you exit the emulator, you'll have to pause it, and that's something that you have to learn the hard way. So let's run something else. This is something else, and I forgot to see what it was, and I can't actually read what it is. But it's coming up with some pictures, and I've downloaded these at random off the internet. So I have no intention of playing any of these games ever, 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 ever again. So I'm not worried about copyright license laws at the moment. In fact, the only thing that I'm worried about this game is going to be terrible. I'm going to quit it as soon as it gets back to the action. So I've no idea what this game is supposed to be or it's going to be. I imagine it's going to be another top-down Zelda clone. So let's use this guy and oh no, it looks like we're racing on a racetrack. Fine, let's try racing on a racetrack. So this is a Japanese Mario Kart game. It looks like, so let's try to figure out the controls, let's hold down that fire button. And finally we are moving. So this is already a thousand percent faster than the NASCAR game that we've seen already. And even though we only get a limited sense of speed when the road is actually moving, it is actually moving and it is actually playable even though we're right at the back. So you can see some signs in the background. And you can see the players, the signs of their heads actually get larger as we move towards them, which is fun. And this isn't quite Mario Kart, but you can see it is possible. And it looks like we're riding around in the bathtub at the moment with wheels on it. And it's not actually possible to handle this chariot once it moves off the road. It's very difficult to control it. So that's my experience of whatever that game was. And so you can have fast-paced racing games on a Nintendo Game Boy, it is possible. Whether that's worth it, I have no idea. F1 Race, let's check that out. And this is the game that I tried uh, moments before that I started up the emulator just to make sure it was working. And this is the game I used to configure up the emulator to make sure it was working. So I have played this one and so actually I did manage to get around and do a lap, so hopefully this is the last time I'm going to have to apologise for pre-practising these games. But you can see this one moves even more quickly due to the illusion of the ground and the graphics moving and wobbling about. And you can see it updates pretty quickly. And we do get a sense of speed, although 280 kilometres per hour might be pushing it a little bit. So this is like a pole position game and it doesn't really require us to slow down much for too many of these corners which is a good thing on this track and when we bump on the cars it will slow us down and it will force us to the side of the road so you have to slow down a little bit for some of the corners and you can see well not much at the moment we rank 8 according to that and uh, we can see we're now approaching that start finish line again so we still rank 8 and it's counting up some times and it's not a bad game definitely if I was playing this on a train or something like that where I wanted to win a game and feel accomplishment that might be actually a game worth checking out so here we go again with another Japanese game that's going to be fantastic let's just run this let's check it out so on full screen mode like this with the old 40 it runs more or less at full speed and with the sound it's fine and you can also change that to different screen mode I think different public screen mode as well but this seems to work for me and it's whatever feels comfortable so I'm not sure whether you can change the colours that we've managed to get or because I'm using an RTG setup at the moment, probably if you're using this on a stock Amiga with stock Amiga screen modes, which hopefully this is one, then maybe the colours you see at the moment will also be stock as well. So, no idea, probably an RTG glitch, even though I'm not actually using an RTG screen mode to play this game. So, in the introduction, you can see something that looks like another one of these huge monsters um, I have seen a number of movies with the huge monsters 
and a number of experts will be able to tell me what these are at the moment. And it's not King Ghidorah, and it's not Mothra, and it's not Godzilla, so I've no idea what it is. But whatever it is, we're now playing that. This is hopefully Mortal Kombat, so Gamera versus something else that I didn't read in time. Gamera now. Um, unfortunately, this isn't Mortal Kombat. You can only strike and repel things using cutscenes. And so if you want a cutscene battle um, simulator, then this is probably it. Uh, let's see what happens. It's another cutscene. The enemy strikes. And BAM! That means... Uh, 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 that means we take a penalty. And... Well... It's not exactly Street Fighter. Although I think that we have got Street Fighter on here at some point. And if you can see P... That's when I'm pressing P. If you press P twice, it will come up with the press screen. So that's why that appears. Um... A long time ago, a ghoul realm barely escaped great peril, really. A large army of destroyers came from blah 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 So this is Gargoyle's quest. This is a rip-off of Ghouls and Ghosts, where we play a Zelda game using a gargoyle from Ghosts and Goblins and Ghouls and Ghosts. And now we can walk around and check out all these guys. It appears to be in English. Um talking about a dimension portal, I don't really care, so this is we can talk, use, level or check something out. So let's see now. Ready, level one. Da da ding 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 da ding Oh, looks like I've been killed already. Looks like those flames in the windows aren't just for decoration. And you can see W at the bottom going down. So maybe playing this on a full screen mode would probably help. And you chanted the resurrection. So I've died twice already and I haven't managed to get off barely at the first screen. So no one to speak to, that's fine. Let's just exit that. Exit, I won't be playing that thing again. Um, what else have we got? Let's move on down now to... Did that say Godzilla? Let's try to run it. It did say Godzilla. 1990 Toho Coal Limited. Um, that's very nice. Uh, that would be if it was in any more than two or three colours. So maybe I'm supposed to press the start button at this point. A new game will continue. Aha! So this game is... Well pretty difficult because you got things killing you straight away and it's something like the 2.5D game where you're supposed to climb up there it reminds me of Mighty Bomb Jack at the moment which is not a good sign and that game was bugged on the Amiga so you couldn't even get past the first few levels it's fantastic that we managed to get a fantastic game that isn't even playable and maybe they fixed that but look at this how am I supposed to escape no idea. So it looks like well we're Godzilla, but we can only looks like punish our way out of trouble. Which is not very good. So let's move on to a Kirby game. Anybody who knows Kirby's adventures will know exactly what this is, down to the last pixel. And so this is 1992. So the Amiga is still going strong at this point. And again, if you have an Amiga 1200, definitely some fast RAM, then try the fast version of this game. It cuts out a few things, and maybe if you put it on frame skip 2, you can play it full screen and all that lot. So you can play a 1992 game on your Amiga, absolutely no problem. And if you put it on warp mode, it will skip a few more things out, so you can actually play it again. So this is a Kirby game, so the aim is to collect things and by pressing the fire button we can soak up whatever it is on the landscape and by doing that we can then fire those things against those enemies. The frame rate isn't perfect, you can see, but it does an adequate job and this game is absolutely playable and it's something that the Amiga could have done with its eyes closed and its hands tied behind its back. But we didn't get anything like this on the Amiga, unfortunately. 
because of licensing issues and I'm probably expecting public to be in rip-offs of this game to appear anytime soon. So this is the end of Level Boss and it doesn't take a genius to work out what we're supposed to do. Collect those bombs and throw them back towards that boss. And we've died. So that's Kirby. It's one of those games that love it or hate it. It's not too bad. And so itchy and scratchy. Again, no idea what this is. This could be a text tapping text adventure for all I know. A claim. A claim in cement. A beam software production itchy and scratchy. So, hole one? Is this golf? This is actually golf. Stand next to the ball. Let's put the ball. What? And it appears that this emulator is capable of refreshing the screen and changing the colour palette or whatever it does but it slows it down to a grind if you do do that so I'm not even going to bother, I'm just going to skip that out some kind of crazy golf, no idea and that's a shame but if it's a tie-in it's probably not going to be that good anyway let's move on to the next one, Jeep Jamboree these games appear fairly quickly and it depends if they're in a zip file or whether they're uncompressed and so you have a world of Game Boy at your fingertips now on virtually any Amiga. Of course, if you've got an Amiga 500, then you can more rule this out from the standpoint you might not have enough memory to get this running in the first place. But if you thought that it was impossible to have Test Drive 2 on the Amiga, no, it is possible. And it did go some length to try and code something in that vein. So a 2.5D game like this with a working wheel and things like that, it was possible. And you can see the screen bounces up and down, so they have coded some effects into this. And it is actually quite fun until you go off the road, and then it's not very fun anymore. So maybe that was a lap, no idea. 16th we are at the moment, and 15th. So that tells us we need to slow down, and we didn't. And we have a map, a real-time map on the bottom of the screen as well, which shows us, hopefully, where we are. So, that's a good game. I'm going to mark that off as a good game. Let's mark that. Playable. So, Killer Instinct. Uh, the name rings a bell. No idea what it might be. Killer Instinct. Dun, dun, dun. Killer Instinct. Oh, look at this. It looks like it's going to be a... It is. It's a Street Fighter clone. So, Street Fighter 2 Hardouken. So, this is the game. Look at that. It's not bad, actually. If you think about it, this is head and shoulders above Target Renegade that we managed to get on the Amiga. In fact, it's head and shoulders above virtually anything that we got on the Amiga, even up to the likes of Shadow Fighter. It wasn't actually this quick. It wasn't actually this nimble when it comes to quack, 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 controls, which is fantastic. And if you wanted this fast controllability, they had to go back to RK Plus and things like that. But the Amiga was capable of doing fast fighters, but it wasn't because it was slowed down by poor programming. It probably shows that this was possible if you reduce the colours down a bit and if you get rid of those stupid background animations where people are bobbing about and you can see that there is backgrounds on this there is tons of maneuvers on offer and you have full control set up both buttons etc so it was possible and that is, that is definitely a great game that is definitely controllable so now we'll move on to Lamborghini Turbo Challenge otherwise known as Crazy Cars 3 and Diablo, Lamborghini Diablo, let's have stereo music. So, anybody who's played Crazy Cars 3 on the Amiga, or even on the humble Commodore 64, will be familiar with this, and this game famously runs in interlaced mode on 
most of the platforms, so fortunately if you're playing this on a Kono 64 it's unplayable. And on the Game Boy, well, it flickers in between screen modes, so you do get the interlacing going on, and that's a, a warning, because if you have migraine headaches and things like that, this thing can do your head in in 0.5 seconds flat. And um, we've chosen a level with um, clouds in the background, and there are other levels and other backgrounds. And you can see it is possible, it is recognisable as Crazy Cars 3. And with that turbo on, it shows us the speed and our position and everything else. But if you have epilepsy, unfortunately, this game is not possible to play it. And a bit like playing modern 3DS games, you'll only be able to stand it for as long as I did. So let's get rid of that. Phew, that was pretty annoying. Uh, Legend, oh no, we haven't got Legend of Zelda on this thing, have we? Let's try that then, Legend of Zelda. It was a dark and stormy night on the Mediterranean. We've got a boat. Legends of it looks like it's all in German, so I'm gonna reset it and load up the English version instead. So, trying to get back into this, and we are playing this character in sleep at the moment, it's sleep in the bed. Let's crawl out of bed. What a relief! I thought you'd never wake up. You were tossing and turning all night. I'm not going to go into that joke. And um, still a little woozy. And fine. What can we do? Give me the sword. No, you can't leave without talking to me. All right, well, what about in these pots? No, the two heavy at the moment. You haven't picked up magic eyes and you can't pick those up. No, you can't leave without talking to the man. No, you can't leave without talking to the man. Let's talk to the man. Well, what's going on? Uh, well, there's something kicking off in town. I've got a bad feeling about this. What? Yep, yeah, you better set off there. Da -da -da -da. You better set off there with your magic shield and sort it out. So here we go. This is Zelda. And this reminds me of every single modern remake of Legend of Zelda. And I've played quite a few of them on the Amiga recently. Amiga RTG Zelda games, of which there are at least four or five. And I had some good fun actually playing those. They're all identical graphically to this. Absolutely identically. So it, it seems like this Zelda graphical style was ripped off from something. I've no idea what it might be. Because I haven't played any of the retro Zelda games. But it's identical. So you can walk in and you can talk to people and get missions. And the aim at the very start of the game is track down the sword. And once you've got the sword, then you can get on with the quest in these types of games. And you're supposed to talk to everybody and move into everything and check everything out. And hopefully... Um, well, hopefully they'll give us a mission eventually. And it's nice to see that robot dog thing on the chain from the Mario game which is a tie-in and I'm not quite sure what Mario elements are doing in the Zelda game but I'm still looking for that sword at the beginning always takes you on a wild goose chase and every single one of these overhead identically looking Mario game uh, Zelda games it always takes us on a wild goose chase oh no we've fallen down now maybe we've fallen down into the wrong area for the sword and it's only once we get the sword that we can start to wield some damage. What's that down there? It looks like a turkey leg. Oh no, it looks like an any spawn box that we're supposed to avoid. So let's avoid that. And... Well, we're not going to get past that mine. Look, the sword's down there, but unfortunately we can't get past that mine. And we didn't get past that. So that's that. Over it looked a bit like it reminded me of Animal Crossing and things like that. Animal Crossing, a horrendous time sink, horrendous time sink. So let's move on to Motor Cross Maniacs. Maybe this is going to be another 3D game, or maybe this is going to be a ripoff of Exile Bike.
In this game, it's more or less a rip-off of Excite Bike, but with also Kickstart 2 elements thrown in, so you get a two-player versus mode, and just like Kickstart and Kickstart 2 on the Commodore 64, you can accelerate and you have to manoeuvre your way around various obstacles. This game's got two buttons, a turbo mode, so you can move to full speed very quickly, and it's got normal mode by pressing the other fire button. You have to press that rapidly, I think, to get the speed going. And we've just completed another lap. You can also pick up some collectibles as well, like nitros, which is the ends. When you pick up the nitros, it means you can outpace that computer racer. Just like Kickstart 2, you'll be falling off rapidly. And Excite Bike as well, you'll be definitely falling off rapidly. And this definitely reminds me of Kickstart 2. It's fairly fun actually, this has got an addictability factor built in. And it reminds me of games on the ZX Spectrum, where you're driving a bike around and... I can't remember the name of that, but I'm sure people know that. And it's quite good actually, but that's it, I'm out of nitros. And even though the computer player is making this a joke for us to catch up, I'm actually rapidly losing interest in this particular game because of all that falling off that I'm doing. Oh, look at that goal. Goal! Let's score a goal. So we're only just behind the lead player. You have qualified. It says it's a record. Not quite sure what kind of record it is. Maybe it's a 12 inch, maybe it's a 7 inch single. Go! It says. So we've managed to get something and you can spin around and that reminds me of what does that remind me of? That PlayStation 1 game where you spin around. Um, I can't remember at the moment. And so let's go. This is another, it even tells you where you're supposed to go. These things are like mazes, it looks like. And it's fairly fun, actually, it's fairly good, but again, oh, look at that, we've discovered our first obstacle. It's a boulder, what we're supposed to do is push up on the controller. That way we can get over the boulder, again, just like Kickstart 2. And just like that Japanese game, I can't remember. I, can't, I think it's called Vib Ribbon. Vib Ribbon. So in that game, you're supposed to do all these things, and every control's got a different thing, but mixing Vib Ribbon up on the on the Game Boy game is is really head mashing at the, at the most intense level. Let's get rid of that, and let's put on something else. So this is Miss Pac-Man, unmarried, of course, to Mr. Pac-Man. And so, in this game, we collect all the dots, and once we've collected all the dots, we also collect those power pills. And the aim of this game is to save the power pills until the last minute, and then you can march all around the map, invulnerable, save them to the last, and then collect the power pill, and that gets us on towards the next one. And if you've done it right, and you follow the formula, then you should be able to get around the maze and completely went the wrong direction then. You should be able to get the maze and collect the pills and clear it. And if you leave any extraneous of those power points around or whatever, then you're going to have to go back and collect those. And then you get to clear the level. And it tells you, well, it's a fairly faithful representation of the arcade game. And it's in that narrow screen ratio, which I like. And the screen scrolls very smoothly, it flips over. And it gives us everything you could imagine from a 19, early 1980s 8-bit uh, arcade video title. Where you put in quarters and you got maybe five minutes of fun out of these before you lost all your lives. And the really great players could make that cash, that 25p, whatever it was, last an hour. So there is a formula, once you know that formula it's not too bad. So that's Mrs. Pac-Man. Or Miss Pac-Man, whatever it was. So let's skip on, let's skip on from that. And again, remember to pause it. 
So we're getting towards the end now. Uh, let's um oh, Pang. Well, Pang. You would imagine that it's a simple geometry game, balls bouncing around. But for whatever reason, I never actually liked this version of Pang during this playthrough because, well, it's not actually that good. For some reason, something's going wrong with it, and I don't find it very playable. But it is Pang. You can see it's Pang. So you can see it is Pang, and most of the collectibles seem to be the lasers. And yeah, there's something about that that I don't like. But let's move on to something that I'm guaranteed to like. This is Parodius. Copyright Palcom Software Limited, Trademark Limited, Parodius Konami. Let's set it up. Parodius and trigger speed. No idea, let's just leave everything on default. Start level one, level normal. Well, maybe I could change that to easy, actually, because, well, knowing me with this game, I'll probably die on the first screen. And this is one of those games where if you collect those power-ups, you can be a master of it. And if you don't, you'll simply die and wipe out. So, I forget which one of these I like. I think it's the Twin Bee, reminding us of Titana Twin Bee. And all these franchises are linked together. And look at this. This starts off identically to Gradius. And Gradius starts off identically to Delta on the Commodore 64. And when you pick up those collectibles, that will speed us up. So these games starting off identically on all these different platforms. If you shoot these, you'll get that. If you shoot these, you'll get that. And they'll always go to that same spot on the screen. And just like the Tana Twin Bee, we also get bells as well, which we can shoot. And those are supposed to turn different colours. But on this version, they only turn maybe two or three different colours. So collecting those bells is pretty difficult. So let's see if we can collect that one. And no, we didn't manage it. We seem to be stuck on the scenery there at some point. And that means we've just lost our first life. But yeah, Parodius is a fantastic game on every single platform that it was ever converted to. Even though nobody bothered to convert it to the Amiga, we still got Tiny Us. Tiny Us is a bit like a Parodius game, only it's nowhere near as good. But look at that, how can you miss that white bell? And so, this game has got bags of charm and bags of character. And you can't fail, if you like shooting ups, you really cannot fail to enjoy this game and the power ups involved and the level design and everything else. And I'm um, a little bird firing little birds down, it looks like, or maybe a whale or something. And once you get those power ups together, this game becomes immaculate. Unfortunately, I'm no good at it, and this very small screen size isn't helping. But if you get good at it and you have the power ups, again, you can march through these screens. Absolutely no problem. And you can see even the chests lob out bad guys. It doesn't take us that long to power up either. There's nothing worse than losing all your power ups and having to take ages powering up all over again. We even put some background graphics in there, some ships on the horizon, some moving water moving up and down, and again, difficult to collect those bells because you've no idea what colour it's meant to be. Let's see, let's collect the white one, and it gives us ah, the power beam. So that means we can fire that ahead of us. If we hold that down, and when we release that fire, that's supposed to go and kill the enemies. I'm not sure what this is supposed to be doing at the moment. I'm not sure which is the weak spot, but eventually it sinks. So that's the first level complete. takes us seamlessly on without any loading because it's a cartridge game on to the second part of the first level or whatever it might be and you can see a fantastic game very well programmed and if you have any kind of love for any kind of video game this thing is amazing so hopefully that's enough of that you can see it's got everything in it that they could possibly get that they could possibly cram in 
I don't know, it looks like we're heading for another end of level boss. So my feelings about Wazonka lad is it's great. And if you again try it with a big old meat CPU, you should be able to have any screen mode you like. And you should be able to have, well, as much as you can. Unfortunately, I'm not too impressed with the colours of the screen mode that I've got it on at the moment. The sound isn't perfect. It's absolutely not perfect. But it is there. It's kind of 70% of the way there. And if you get the screen modes right and everything else, the scrolling and everything else updates at the right speed. So this is definitely playable. It is definitely a game that, well, this is definitely an emulator that does an immaculate job of trying to emulate a Game Boy on an Amiga. There are various ones around. This isn't the only one around. What does that give us? That gives us, uh, it looks like it's put us into big mode so we can now collide with any of the enemies and kill them straight away. But that wears off, unfortunately. Let's return back to our list. Getting towards the end, let's see, mini racing, is that going to be any good? Let's check that out. Mini racing on the Game Boy, it looks like, well, it tried to use interlace, and it's still trying to use interlace, and it's actually a Japanese game, so if I leave that on any longer it's not going to do us any good. Let's try something else, shall we? And... Uh, one of those doesn't work unfortunately, so we'll move on. Capcom presents Street Fighter 2! Wow, this is the actual Street Fighter 2 on an actual clone of Game Boy. Let's try the normal thing Ken vs. Ryu fight! So, this is us, and of course, Deal, or however you pronounce it has automatic access to all of the special moves and we're actually trying to do the special move at the moment. It's forward, back, forward, fire. It's very easy to do forward, back, forward, fire. But however much I'm trying to do it, I'm just punching the guy and that's not actually working. So that's round one. So let's move on to the next one. Round two, fight. And so let's try to ignore the special move this time and let's try to play it normally, or at least a bit more normally, and still soaking up all those collateral damages, fortunately at the moment. And I'm still trying to do the special move, and there it is, I managed to do it once during this entire playthrough. Of course this moves and handles much quicker than the Amiga version that we got and I'm much more impressed by that than Super Street Fighter 2, Turbo or whatever else they tried to concoct onto the Amiga. A very limp wristed slap dash effort if you don't mind me saying so as most Amiga conversions were back in the day because they were cheap cash in efforts. Let's move on to something else. Looks like a Super Mario World game where we can collect all these coins and no idea what they're supposed to do for us. And by bumping into these things, we can collect power ups. And it's got pixel perfect collision detection, as you would imagine. And you would imagine there's some power ups in here, but there isn't. So, playing Great Gianna Sisters on the Amiga, there's supposed to be one in, but I can't find it. So. These pipes and tunnels usually lead to bone series as well, and so anybody who's played Super Mario would like this kind of game. It's not exactly Lionheart, it's not exactly, I don't know, Brian the Lion or Wolf Child or anything decent, but it is a pretty basic platformer where you can go around banging your head on the ceiling and collecting coins. So it's a capitalist game, we collect coins. 
So that fight was huge in America and I'm not actually very fond of it. But it's an 8-bit game, so of course the Game Boy can emulate it no problem. And it's got that kind of speed, so if you like this type of game, obviously you'll like this type of game. So I was never a big fan of it, and even the adventures of Quick and Silver on the Amiga is head and shoulders more fun than this game could ever hope to be. So check out that, Adventures of Quick and Silver. So hopefully we can skip out of that. Remember to press that P key a number of times. And now we're getting to the bottom of our list. Good. Super Mario Land, Super Mario Land 4, Tetris. Are we even gonna bother with Tetris? Turrican doesn't work, unfortunately, on this thing. And X. X, I wonder what X is. Uh, is that working? Ah, right, this is a technical demo that I downloaded. This is actual 3D on a Game Boy and just to prove that it was actually possible. And this is like a battle zone game where we get to drive maybe a tank. And this is actually um, a wireframe demo. This isn't actually, well, I think this is me playing the game, but it's also a demo where it comes up with different things that it can do. And you can shoot different things down, missiles and things like that, trees. And so it just proves that it was possible to do 3D on a Game Boy. I don't think anybody actually managed to do that as an actual game. Um, you know, but it was actually possible to do that. So that's just the demo that I downloaded. And the final game that we'll be playing, well, the final game will be True Lies. Let's just check out this Tetris, just for the sake of it, just for the sake of completeness. Tetris, licensed to bulletproof software. So let's get this licensed product. And you can see, instead of colours, they've just put a few dots on there. And this all reminded me of cigarette filters, or cigarette butts, when I used to, well, when I played this the once, back in the day. And that's pretty strange, you would have thought that some of these could be white, some of those could be darker, and they didn't automatically have to go to these different lengths to go with the colours. And they didn't even have to colour them in. But you can see it is possible, it's the classic Tetris that everybody remembers. So let's put this together and get some score. So Tetris on the Amiga. There's umpteen million Quadris, Twintris, Tritris, Tetris games on the Amiga. So let's skip over them. And for the final time, ladies and gentlemen, True Lies. So Stallone we've played, so let's try an LJN, it's another Beam software caching True Lies. And unfortunately, this game doesn't work because my character is invisible, so I can't see anything. But you can see the cutscenes and everything else. So this emulator, I'd say it's probably 80% compatible with everything, which is darn good. The other 20% are mainly games which try to push the frontiers a little bit. And so that's not bad, I give this emulator at a rating of 8 out of 10. So thank you for viewing this play of this emulator and we'll see you again on another play of another emulator on your Amiga sometime soon. Thank you.